warm welcoming back to this year program, Think Tech Hawaii, and this is our show, Human Humane Architecture. If you have watched all the episodes, you're in the 340th, and we are happy to have you back. We is us all over the world here. We have with us today from Barcelona, Pedro Capriata, and we have from originally from uh, Colombia, the country of Martin Ancelini, who is now with us here as well. And we have me, Martin Despang, finally back from his uh, summer in Germany. And uh, Jay Fidel sent us for some of the next shows via Portugal, which is where you see this slide here from. We're going to have, uh, have to report about that because that's your if not your favorite country. And uh, Pedro, uh, you are not from there originally either, so it's e easier to take for you as well. And it's a neighboring country, as we know, of, of Spain, and they have kind of a love and sometimes uh, comp competitive relationship with each other. So we're gonna talk more about it. Above me here, you have our exotic es escapism expert, Susanna. And she's posing in front of something that might make us jealous because this is the subway uh, in Porto, uh, which is her uh, Hanai home, as we call it here, when a family unofficially adopts you. And so we're in the subway here that was designed by Pritzker Prize winners. And this is not a name dropping of star architects because these are local boils. Uh, this is uh, Alvaro Ziza and uh, Eduardo Sudomura that her Hanai mother was working for and with, particularly on these stations. And Martin, your comment, everyone can read uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the bottom left when we were talking about this project. I want to throw in who uh, we have down there, Kenneth Frampton, um, very seasoned now. He was born in 1930, and many consider him one of the major architectural theoreticians and, and historians. And he once said that he believes that the future of architecture is not within, and sorry Americans, sorry Germans, with these sort of full of themselves uh, Western uh, developed cultures and countries, but the ones who more or less recently came out of totalitarian regimes. This is certainly true for um, Portugal and Barcelona, who at the same time in the mid 70s escaped these. And I have to do this quickly here, uh, expressing my worries that uh, before the show, Jay, you were sharing as well. There is a really, really scary uh, right-wing tendency trend all over the world, and including in one of the countries that shouldn't do that, because we had the NSDAP and the um, back then, and we had the GDR. So back in Germany, we had two scary totalitarian regimes, and. The current state elections where this AFD, this right-wing party uh, in one state uh, won the majority and the other one that my father lives his home state and we have the office at uh, almost is really, really scary. And that's why we want to talk about um, discussion, discourse, very important, and uh, places and spaces that facilitate that. Because even though you might not agree with the others, you have to continue to talk with each other. And in best case, not hiding behind screens, which sorry, we're doing, or tomorrow where you all will be in front of the screen and listen to current uh, vice president and hopefully soon president of the United States, Harris versus past and hopefully never again, um, President uh, T. Rump, as you, uh, Jay, and Chuck, and um, and uh, were talking in the show. Uh, so hopefully never again. So the Agora, this is a, a school project we did so many years ago, the Agora effect we basically need again. And with that, uh, a little bit more of a viewer discretion advisory here, because we're going to do what Civil Beat has told Kurt Sandburn not to do, is report from other places they pulled him off civil beat because of that reason. We basically want to do that. We want to send us out into the world to learn for us. And the other thing to be prepared for uh, might be a shock. We actually might learn a lot from you, Pedro, especially in your Barcelona. Um, and it might make us feel bad and sad that there are so many goodies. And you just said before the show, we are not perfect either. Well, who is? But let's go to the stuff that's excitingly different. Introduce yourself really quick, Pedro, um, where you come from, uh, actually from Peru, right? And uh, what got you to this uh, movement here, to this organization, which is called Guarding Arch Architects Barcelona, which is uh, one of the many things we don't have, but maybe we get one here. 
So who are you and what is this about, Pedro? Okay, so uh, I'm a Peruvian architect, as you mentioned. Uh, I came to study for a couple of years in the 1990s here in Barcelona, and I fell in love with the city. I didn't want to leave, but I had to at that time. So I went back to Peru, and eventually I came back. Uh, when I came back, uh, the excuse was uh, a PhD that I actually, I eventually completed. Uh, I mean the excuse because I really wanted to do the PhD, but I, it was also an excuse to come back to Barcelona. And uh, I just stayed after that. So that was in 2004. So I've been living for, for 20 years now, uh, plus the, the two extra years in the 1990s, which also allowed me to have a little perspective on how the city has changed. I had the chance to visit the city briefly, though, but in the 1980s, for example, uh, and I've kind of witnessed, not, not in such in a direct way, the, the transformation of the city. Uh, I fell in love with, with Barcelona because it's a combination of things. Uh, you have you have the sea, you have architecture from all periods. I like very much history of architecture. So we have a couple of Roman things, a lot of medieval architecture, great contemporary architecture, and this kind of special vibe that the city has. And that is kind of what we're uh, be talking about, I'm guessing. And uh, guiding architects specifically, I uh, started working with them two and a half years ago. I was mm, I started contacting people and looking for companies that were doing this. I had done this in an academic level, this idea of uh, of an architect guiding. Um, in that case, it was students. I had done it a couple of times. Uh, while I was a lecturer at a university. And I said, well, this is, I think this is something I could enjoy, you know, like a, like a tourist guide, but something a little more specialized in architecture. And that's how I, uh, I had a friend who knew the people in Guiding Architects and I joined them, as I said, a couple, a couple of years ago. Yeah, and you got this great website here that the link is at the very bottom right, so you can guys get on there. And so this picture here really makes the connection. I mean, the show sequence here is called Fellow Maritime Metropolis. So both Honolulu and Barcelona have are at the coast, and they also have what we call Mauka, which is mountains, and we also have Makai, which is the ocean. So this picture that you guys choose depicts this really well. So you barely actually see a city. All you see is mountains and and water, but in the next or the other one that you provide on your website, you can see how much of a city it is. And I think, Martin, we have to do a little bit of a date uh, correction here because we were talking about this, uh, the grid, the layout of the city blocks with a cut of 45 degree corners. And we were dating it to the uh, 1920s or something, but of course it's, well now, of course, it's way older, right? So yeah. uh, that that is- 18... 1860, approximately. Yeah, there you go. And that's something we talked about and we will talk about that we're jealous of. And the other one is this one here where you can see that the city, the built environment almost acts as sort of a threshold between the uh, the natural environments of the ocean and, and the mountains here. And especially the developments on, on the coast uh, are very interesting. We already talked about in the sort of the warming up shows, Pedro, about the high rises that you have few but better ones and we have more and less good ones or we are increasingly <laughs> become less good ones um we talked about uh, that uh, some events you know like of course the 1920 what was it 20 something eight or so the the world's fair right and then you had uh, the, the one 19... in the 90s 1929 well there was the, yeah. the oldest one that was already an event an important event was the the 1888 uh, world yeah. exhibition uh, and then we had the 1929 yeah and uh well after that the maybe the biggest event was the the forum which is was considered by some of like a failure as as, a, as an event itself and then well we had a series of other minor events now we have the america's cup going on i don't know i was gonna I say know. so there's a lot Hopefully. going on <laughs> And us, that's why we're jealous because, um, you know, Porto, by the way, the subway that Suzanne's mother worked on, Porto is a coastal city as well, right? At least, you know, you got the river there and that gets to the ocean, you know, pretty soon. 
And so um, it, it, you can put public transportation underground, even in coastal cities. There's many in the world, even New York City, right? That basically works. And this is what we got kind of sad and sentimental about. This is our most prominent part of downtown Honolulu, where the Aloha Tower that DeSoto once in, in a show about the history of high rises said it was the first uh, high rise. It was only eight or nine stories tall. And uh, so these are a couple of previous shows, show quoting here and showing all the attempts, the ones at the top. And recently, Martin, we did the Fryscaping. Uh, we shared this crazy development by Chris Hemeter, uh, this sort of megalomanic in the 90s that drove him off the island. And at the bottom is something really sweet by uh, Bundet Anikakon and, and Rich Lowe, who, by the way, has left us at least on earth recently. We're gonna talk about that and what he taught us and what he will continue to teach us somewhere in the future. And they did this proposal here where not only this elevated train is eventually coming into the city, but they just put this stuff, the vehicular traffic underground, which many cities have done and really allow the city to connect. So we don't have that. What we have, and thank you, Pedro, you said, you know, you will not, uh, sugarcoat everything you have, because this is exactly how it looks uh, out there on Nimitz Highway, Alamoana Boulevard. It's just heavy traffic. So when you're in, 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 in Barcelona most of the day, it's also going to look this way, right? Fossil vehicular traffic is still the dominant mode of transportation, even though you have commuter trains, you share it, you live in the outskirts, you hop the train, uh, you got the buses, you got the subway, you got electric scooters, which we used, um, but still that fossil fueled car is still the predominant. Is that fair or I guess, you know, as bad as it is, but it's the way it is, right? It, it's it's still very important. Uh, we're working, of course, on changing it. That's one of the positive things. Uh, I don't know if you, in your last visit, you had the chance to visit, for example, the, a street called Conseil de Sint. It's a re relatively long street, and they they pedestrianized the whole street, and this was like a really uh, a daring. Um, well, it's not this one, but <laughs> in, no, no, in any no. case, uh, I was really. Are they really going to dare to do this? And they did it. And it's uh, uh, this. Th there was also a well. This is kind of a, an anecdote that goes, but the some of the neighbors of this street uh, sued the the mayor. Of Barcelona because they were against this project and as soon as the project was completed they happened to win the lawsuit uh, but they said okay we won the lawsuit but we just want our uh, legal expenses reimbursed we like the project <laughs> after all <laughs> so it was really it was really um it was a combination of uh lack of communication which I think is fundamental for uh, any institution city council etc and a little bit also probably of uh, political animosity against the, the mayor. There was a lot of people that everything the mayor, uh, the former mayor of Barcelona, and I will have a new one, a recent, very recent one. Uh, everything she did seemed terrible and they were kind of against it. Uh, but I think this, the fact that this street, they, they had this street pedestrianized um, in the middle of the city, such a long street, and supposedly it's a prototype. They're going to do more of these. Uh, a lot of people said, well, what's going to happen with all the cars? I mean, the other streets are going to be even more crowded. There's going to be more traffic. So far, it's not that evident. Uh, and of course, theoretically, this has to be compensated with more and better public transportation, with more bicycles, with more trains, with more buses, etc. So let's hope it works. It's it's really uh, something to, to hope for. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a way to go, but things, there's sometimes little details can make a very interesting project derail. Uh, so we have to cross our fingers and hope things will, will go well with this one. Literally and figuratively oh. speaking. And this almost leaves before, I think the rest of the show is probably for you, Martin, in so many ways, because before the show, when you had a hard time uh, getting ready because you did the right thing, so this is almost staged. I think your shirt, as sweaty as it is, greatly so, because you were doing the bicycle up to work, the UH uh, Ivy Tower. Is it actually in 2008, because the picture, the picture is from you, the guy on the bicycle, is that you as well? And it looks soaked as well. So 
That being said, um, you know, we and we threw in the little uh, exhibit poster there of Bandit that he did about Fourth Street Mall. So Fourth Street Mall is here about the only uh, the only street that Jay, the studio, used to be at Pioneer Plaza, that they were brave enough somewhere back in the 70s to actually make pedestrian. And so, um, and, and, and this is a picture, again, when you were there in 2008, Martin, and you spent an entire year there, this is from that time and you provided that picture. So please elaborate on, on that. And also, by the way, in warming up and waiting for you to get, you know, um, catch breath to be with us here from your brave bicycling, uh, Jay shared about a show with a lawyer um, in, in Bogota in your hometown who was fighting for bringing public transportation to the outskirts because it is very important to connect the rural community. And we know how important that is with the upcoming election, right? Because people who are isolated literally and figuratively might make sort of uneducated choices. So all of that and more, let us hear, Martin, what are your thoughts? No, yeah, you, you know, like linking to what Pedro was mentioning in, in Barcelona, things happen. In, in Barcelona, these big projects that sometimes could look utopic were happening and are happening. No, the the B sync system was working, and this was almost 20 years ago. No, Barcelona was one of the first cities to implement it. Uh, then other cities started to use it, and, and at the beginning, everybody I remember in that even at that time, people were still saying no, everybody will rob the bicycles. And then they implement it, and it is working. It works perfectly. We were using it. That that guy is my brother. We were like biking around the city. Uh, this is Paseo Colón, which is probably my favorite city. I mean, I have not been recently, so every time there are things happening in Barcelona, because it works very good. There is a there is a an almost a, a highway underground that could be. That could perfectly be uh, uh, this system could perfectly be, be implemented in Honolulu's waterfront, which is the relation of the downtown with the water in Honolulu is very bad, no? At the downtown, and even in Kakaako, no? Waikiki is different, which is good, uh, uh, but we cannot bike in Waikiki, but this is another story. Uh, and a, a highway as such a like big intervention as Paseo Colón could be very easily done. Uh, in in uh, like heavy uh, car traffic transportation roads, no? because here we have this Alameda, this path on which we can walk, we can bike. Then there is a bike fast bike line, which is different than the promenade bike. Then we have like good sidewalks. Then we have a bus traffic and low uh, uh, speed line, and then we have the highway underneath. So this is like a very like complex and very well done path, very close to the to the city center and boarding the water. They have to pump water all the time out of this highway because it is uh, under the uh, sea level, under the under the sea level. So yeah, this is Barcelona. Uh, just just uh, complementing what Pedro was mentioning, there are all the time things happening and there is really innovation through uh, architecture, which is great, no? Architects, we were talking, uh, Pedro, these previous uh, sessions here that in, in Barcelona, architects are, are powerful, are very powerful. No? Uh, the, the architectural, the figure of the architectural competition as a as a space for democratic talk uh, around public space and public realm in general is, is very powerful. And, and this is something that we can like really uh, uh, bring in general to the US. We were talking about that uh, previously. So, so powerful that there was a politician who once said this this is like, like it was like an open uh, microphone that stayed open and she uh, said something like uh we should kill all architects or something like that <laughs> <laughs> this was a the former president of the madrid community <laughs> Yeah, that's what one of the pr first presidents of Germany said as well about the Chancellor Bungalow, which is a beautiful mid-century modern courtyard house, but it depends on where you stand, right? But I, I think the, the point is well taken. And this is, by the way, for you, Jay, one, if not your favorite and so relevant topic of public spaces and places and how they educate people. So this is not 
before we even get inside of architecture. This is in between architecture, right? That architecture serves as a stage. Um, and, and this one here, there's also, um, you know, um, as an unfortunate um, reality, Pedro, is that the last recession in 2008 had hit, uh, you know, Spain really, really hard, harder than others. And uh, especially, I mean, there was a, there's always a good thing about everything bad. American architectural education benefited because lots of the very, very talented, powerful Martin architects ran out of work and got recruited by American universities. So every good uh, school of architecture actually has one. Um, we need one too. Uh, here, <laughs> by the way, as a little side note. And so, um, but the, the youth, there's a really, you know, large percentage of youth unemployment. And this is pulling from the Barcelona website as well here um, about the numbers. And so the city is actually doing something about it, right? And even on a touristic, I mean, this is at a tourist stand with a postcard. There's this postcard that says Skate Barcelona City, right? So, you know, public spaces can actually activate, um, you know, disadvantaged, uh, you know, parts of the population and, and, and engage them. Is that fair to say, guys? I, I think it's very important. And I totally agree that it, it also depends a lot on the way you use it. This is uh, because I would say that this particular space, for example, that you're showing is not the mo not the best public space in Barcelona. I think it works uh, a lot thanks to Richard Meyer's building because most of the buildings around the, the the square are like the back of something or some weird looking postmodern uh, design. So um, in, in this particular case, uh, I think it has to do with the location and probably also with, as I said, with Richard Meyer's uh, building, you know, that, that gives the, the plaza some a lot of character. It has also uh, the, the ramps that allow the skaters, you know, this has been a hot spot for skaters. But for example, in, I remember clearly in this space, uh, uh, once I was, I would live close to this neighborhood at the time, uh, actually in this neighborhood, not close to it. And I was walking past, uh, past this plaza and there was, uh, they were celebrating uh, Bengali New Year. There was a whole, uh, there was a stage and a lot of people in in uh, in like in party dresses. And I didn't wasn't even aware that there was such a big community of people from from Bangladesh in Barcelona. No, but the fact that the city council uh, allowed the use of public space for this activity, you know. I think it encourages uh, the the diversity, the cultural diversity of the city, for example. And of course, not only people of Bangladesh were were there celebrating. There was a lot of people from Barcelona, even tourists, etc. You know, and, and I think this uh, adds to the livelihood of these kind of spaces. So it's it's not just a a place for skateboarders. <laughs> I mean, it's mm -hmm. uh, and for example, they do uh, in this plaza. They also do sometimes um, a book fair for children. Yeah, and so yeah, this is proving, yeah, and what you said, I mean, the name Richard Meyer, this is sort of a triggering uh, <laughs> topic because um, in a show not that recently around the think tech transitioning to your one-man band uh, producing it in your Nuano home, Jay, thank you for that. There's a show we called Capital Concentration and we report about that we're supposed to get a Richard Meyer as well as part of the Kakaako the the Howard Hughes Howley cowboys that came here and well you know we said it was probably sort of a um, an age design back to the New York Five back then that they kind of wanted to repurpose or recycle but everything is relative as Einstein said right so now with all the towers that are actually not any better maybe even more boring by Solomon Cortwell Buens Maybe we get sentimental about you know a Richard Meyer that we that we didn't get. So again, that's uh, another thing to make us. So again, back to 2008, Martin, jump in. I think this is the neighborhood you lived in or around it by that time, right? And this this is a public library in 2005. So we haven't seen here libraries. There was a, there's a great tradition of libraries here, mid-century modern in Honolulu. 
but if I'm not mistaken, I haven't seen any recent one that um, allows the young upcoming architects to prove themselves. So what, uh, what kind of excited you about this one here back then, Martin? No, that building, I don't know if you agree, Pedro, but uh, it seems beautiful to me. I was there, this was actually, we went one year before 2007 with Bonel that they were teaching in Mendrizio where I was studying at that time. Uh, he's also a renewed uh, architect uh, in Barcelona that did many projects with a more project. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about architectural languages, but this is again another story. <laughs> uh, uh, but look at the architectural language of this building. I mean, this building is really in a very elegant way because, and this is of course objective, uh, uh, it seems super elegant to me in, in his shapes. Uh, but saying that uh, I am present and, and, I, I, and uh, we, for example, back in Colombia and in many places, because we look very much to Spain and in particularly architects look very much to Barcelona in Latin America, we, uh, we somehow inherited this ethics of like bringing the best quality uh, for public buildings and public spaces. And this applies uh, to, to design and also uh, to materials and, and details. No, uh, look, look how this building is built. It's like very high quality. No? It's not, let's try to, to save as much as possible because uh, it is public money and let's make it cheap because we have to save money to, I don't know what, uh, but let's do as best as possible from something that will endure. No, In Barcelona, we uh, this ethic was made, was the, the ethic that, uh, 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 built uh, Santa Maria del Mar, you know, like let's build the, the public, public buildings must be the best buildings, not the worst. You know? uh, and this, this is what we are seeing here and probably in the following slides, right? Unfortunately, in Peru, it also works that way. I mean, there's the, 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 the National Library is like, oh my God, they couldn't really, they couldn't do anything better than this. And that's the national library. And here in Barcelona, you have like a neighborhood library that is 10 times better than, than any library in Peru. <laughs> yeah. Go on the next level. We Germans recently in the last talking world fairs, we have been with you because the last German pavilions on world fairs have been a big, big disaster. Versus, for example, you know, going to the neighboring Portugal, you know, in um, the one in Lisbon, the Portuguese pav pav pavilion by, by Ziza is a beautiful example of a non-building. It's actually public space and place that could got, get us smoothly actually to the next slide because it has a lot in common with this one here. And we're nearing kind of the end of our exciting half hour. So we need to continue with all that next week. But maybe as a kickoff here, you guys share with us what that project is. And it's again from the same era, 2004 in, in Nebraska, in uh, at the University of Lincoln, Nebraska, I had the, the honor to have one of the Spanish architects in exile, so to speak, Patricia Morgado. And she actually brought the architects uh, that are listed down there at the bottom left to speak at our school and basically present this project here hot off the press because I started out in 2005 there and um, I knew the project from the publication at the very top right because a little expo train stations got published in there next to this very heroic project uh, on the title page so we were so excited to have the architects come all the way to into the heartland of Nebraska and talk about it so quickly before we have to uh, let the audience go only to get them back next time to elaborate more on that one uh, both of you give us quick your intel on, on that project. You want to start, Martin? Pedro, you have much more to say than me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually, this was, a, there was a slightly controversial project, not because of the, of the panel itself, because, but because it was part of the forum uh, uh, event. As I mentioned, there was a lot of controversy about the forum because uh, supposedly some of the space that was supposed to become public was not 100% public. There was, they built a private marina, their uh, uh, private harbor. Uh, but uh, I think at the end, beyond the, the success or failure of the event itself, 
uh, the area, for example, around the around the this building, you know, it's I call it building because it's it's a little hard to define. You no, know, this giant solar panel, uh, I think it's it works relatively well. Uh, the problem is that it's a little far away from the most uh, from the most important paths from streets. You no, know, but once you get there. It's it's a relatively pleasant space. I mean, it's uh, I would say that in any case, the the, the defect would be that you no, know, the fact that it's not that well communicated with with the city itself. And, uh, Martin, the picture maybe... at the bottom is from you when you were there and well, eight, and when it was just completed four years before that. So share your thoughts from back then and now, looking back. Yeah, no, just just probably to 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 leave it open for next conversation is underneath there is the all the sewage system, all the recycling of the water of the city underneath. So there is this interesting uh, mixing of uh, civic infrastructure with uh, good public spaces. This apply for normally, I mean, it's more common to see these kind of projects in, in public transportation related projects, but also in this case. Uh, I find pretty amazing uh, uh, the, the fact of having like the the the, the recycling water system of the city uh, on uh, underneath a huge plaza where uh, concerts are, are 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 taking place and fairs. So wrapping up, bringing this home, this could remind us of making us totally jealous. That's why viewer discretion advised to Kewalo Basin, which is the front yard harbor of Kaka'ako. And um, while we were saying how iffy the PPPs are, right? Being P three times public-private partnership. But again, um, if, if you come up with something like this and have criticism as you were sharing, Pedro, this would be a really good problem to have back here in Honolulu um, at our most controversial harbor slash uh, beach area. With that, we're going to look at this building and many other public uh, spaces and places uh, that make us jealous here and we can learn from and obviously goes always both ways. So for that, we look uh, forward to have you all back uh, next week, uh, same time, same place. And until then, uh, stay very Barcelonian. Bye-bye, <laughs> guys. <laughs>